dispatchers of Reddit. What calls have you taken on the non-emergency line? That were definitely an emergency. Used to work for the 111 service, which is supposed to be non-emergency. The most memorable ones was when a guy's wife just fell asleep. Yeah, she was dead. Another one was a mum called us after her 18-month-old wouldn't wake up. After she dropped it down a frickin' flight of stairs. And she was contacting us about seven hours after it occurred. One was a guy whose mum called us as she had some concerns for her son's mental health. Gives me his number, so I give him a call. All I hear is... Edit. It was her daughter-in-law's number, if I recall correctly. He's got a knife. Please, my baby. And the call cuts out. Everything turned out relatively fine, according to the call notes. A call from a phone box from a guy saying he was taking some drugs, he wouldn't say which, with his friend, who then had an overdose and started foaming at the mouth and went a funny color so the guy ran away. I asked when this occurred, to which the guy responded about 15 minutes ago. I never found out what the specific outcome was, but let's be honest. Plenty of strokes, heart attacks, kids drinking bleach, basically anything and everything you could imagine. You'd be calmly asking questions while frantically gesturing the universal phrase for, Why are you calling us? Got a call on a Sunday afternoon that went like this. My wife has taken a bit of a funny turn. Maybe 7 out of 10 times I heard this phrase it ends up being some kind of common stroke symptom. Been complaining that her arm went numb and she started slurring her speech. She's been feeling dizzy and complaining of a really bad headache. We didn't call anyone because it was the weekend but it's got a lot worse. Okay, when did the symptoms begin? Friday afternoon. The duality of man is really crazy here. The amount of people who will call for nothing but actually call the emergency line versus the amount of people who will call the non-emergency line with an emergency seems surprisingly, I don't know, equal in my mind. People are just not good at assessing the situations. Story 2. One time I called 311 because a guy had a handsaw and was cutting down a tree along the sidewalk of Clark Street in Chicago. The 311 operator said she was connecting me with 911. I tried to say, it's not a big deal, just send someone when you can, etc. She interrupted. You're telling me that a man with a saw is on Clark Street and showing signs of being nuts? Huh. Yep, 911 please. Story 3. I used to work for 111, which is the non-emergency medical line here in the UK. I once had a call from a carer for an elderly lady who was wheelchair bound and pretty much immobile. Upon taking the call, one of the first questions I ask is, can I possibly speak to the patient, which is normally a quick yes or no. The carer hmmmed for a good couple of minutes before deciding, no, I couldn't speak to the patient. Her reasoning? Well, the patient couldn't breathe and was turning blue. Well, they answered your question honestly, I guess. Probably should have reached that conclusion a little sooner and maybe got on with it, but uh, the question was answered. Story 4. A friend and I were walking my dog past a local elementary school over winter break when we thought we heard a fire alarm ringing and faintly smelled smoke. We figured we were both just over-imaginative since nobody was around or seemed to be concerned. An hour later, as we were walking back, we passed to the elementary school again, and the alarm and the smoke smell were still there. We decided to call the non-emergency line since nobody else in the surrounding neighborhood seemed to have noticed anything, and we didn't want to look like teenagers pulling a prank. Operator answered, and after we explained it to her, she said, Wait, you're telling me you think an elementary school has been on fire for the past hour? and you didn't consider that an emergency? The fire was pretty small and there was no structural damage. But yeah, it was not a smart moment. I've never even told my mother that I'm one of the unnamed sources that alerted the authorities to a fire in a local elementary school. It is a secret my dog and I will take to our graves. I get it though, if everyone around is acting like it's chill, you kind of feel a bit nuts for wanting to call someone. You're like, am I overreacting here? Is this weird? I don't know. So good on you for calling anyone, OP. Story 5. Not a dispatcher, but a paramedic. We got a call for a fall and the patient only needed help up. Per dispatch notes, reporting party said a patient was breathing, conscious, and was at her normal mental status. We didn't run lights and sirens due to no apparent life threats and the relatively short distance. Under two miles with light traffic. Get inside. Patient is having a full-blown stroke. She is unresponsive and was struggling to breathe. The wall right next to her head had a hole that busted through the drywall. Patient ended up having a hemorrhagic stroke, and it was believed to have happened when she hit the wall. We took her home on hospice a few days later. Still annoys me to this day about the whole situation, but you live and you learn. However, there's not much we or the hospital could have done. Family honored her wishes and asked for comfort measures. Maybe all those things cropped up after they reported it in? That's the only thing I could think of. If not, then the reporting party wanted her dead. Story 6. Almost 10 years in 911 here. I think it's about a 50-50 split for emergencies taken on 911 lines versus non-emergency admin lines. Shock does really weird things to people, and some people panic and call in emergencies that aren't emergencies to any rational person, but the caller isn't thinking rationally. I've taken calls for someone harming themselves with a firearm, rollover accidents, and house fires on non-emergent lines, only to have to turn around and answer a 911 line for something like, 
My neighbor's dogs are barking and won't shut up. Story 7. Got a non-emergency call from a mother telling me her daughter, who was home alone, called her mom, and said that someone just kicked in her front door and she was hiding under her bed with the person roaming through the house. So I dispatch all my units, in which they get there in about two minutes. Just turned out that it was the landlord that gave 24 hours notice to come fix a light. Definitely an emergency that turned out to be nothing, but mom should have called 911 in that situation. Story 8. I've taken many legit emergencies on the non-emergency line. Most memorable was a lady who shot her husband and just called us to collect the body. What always shocked me was when it was busy and I would ask, is this an emergency or can you hold? People would always say they could hold, but then have legit emergencies. Like, no, your stab wound cannot hold. I often found that in shock, people tend to get hyper-focused on one detail and leave out vital ones. Story 9. Once a man tried to climb in my bedroom window. At the time, I had a really old crappy bed that was always coming apart. So I pulled the leg off and scared him away with it. Then I called the non-emergency numbers because he was already gone. There was a helicopter overhead and the cop cars at my door in less than a minute. The dispatcher was like, next time you can just call 911. Story 10. I've taken one where a guy told me that he just shot his neighbor. Another where a man said that he woke up and found his wife had unalived herself sometime during the night. Multiple elderly women to say that their husband had passed away in the night as well. Old women take it in stride. Old men, though, break down when they find their wife dead. I've been a 911 dispatcher for over 30 years now. And when I first started back in the late 80s in SE, Oklahoma, all the calls came in on our seven-digit number. They didn't get 911 there till 2002. I moved to the city in the early 90s. Story 11. Not me, but someone I know. We have this thing called Arztefunkdienst, which is a non-emergency hotline where you can call on weekends and workdays from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. if you're sick and want to visit from a general practitioner. It's to keep the ambulances from getting too many non-emergency calls. Usually, people wait around 30 minutes to 4 hours depending on workload. One day, a retirement home nurse, not sure if an actual nurse or someone else, calls and tells our dispatcher someone coded and they're providing CPR. The dispatcher guided them while also connecting to the main ambulance service. Just before he could connect them, they also told him their building is on fire. In the end, the one guy coding was declared dead, but no one else was hurt. Never heard what exactly happened or if the fire and CPR were related. Story 12. I don't want to be a bother, but I've been on the floor for four days and I haven't had anything to eat or drink and nobody has a key but me. I just need a bit of help off the floor. He'd managed to crawl to the phone and kick the table till it fell. He was so dehydrated he spent a week in intensive care. I work for the fire service, so we get a lot of not in emergency emergencies. I had an old lady call once and very calmly say, I have a small fire in my kitchen. We sent a couple of fire engines and building fully encased in fire. In the time between taking the call and arriving, the fire shouldn't have taken the whole building. They reckon from CCTV that her call was made when the whole house was already alight. She was just super chill. Also had a very calm caller to a fire outside near a village. And when we got there, it was a fully involved recycling center on fire. Building was massive and full of the sort of thing you don't want to be on fire. It happens surprisingly often, especially from other emergency services. Police will pass a minor RTC and will turn up and it's three lorries, two cars, a fatality, air ambulance required the works. Honestly, it never ceases to amaze me. Story 13. 911, what's the location of your emergency? Hi, I need a non-emergent transport of a patient from X nursing facility to the hospital. Okay, how old and what sex is the patient? Uh, 79 and female. Okay, what is the issue she has? Well, she fell and hit her head against concrete and now isn't breathing. And this is non-emergent? Yes. Okay, I have them en route. Have you started CPR? No. Should we? This is like the third nursing facility one, isn't it? I'm sensing a pattern here. Story 14. A tornado hit a nearby town, and the influx of calls was too great for their county to handle. So I got the overflow. I took dozens of calls from a city I wasn't familiar with, with people screaming about being buried in rubble or saying they couldn't find their child. One man said his neighbors were gone because they lived in a manufactured home next door and the entire thing was missing. Not knocked down or heavily damaged, missing, as if it was snapped out of existence. Not a great day. And for levity, this one should have caused more emergencies but didn't. We had a minor earthquake once, 5.2. This was shortly after 4.30 in the morning. I had dozens of 911 calls that went like this. 911, what's your emergency? Did we just have an earthquake? Yes, what is your emergency? Thinking a wall collapsed, someone is hurt, gas leak, etc. Oh, I don't have an emergency, I just wondered if it was an earthquake. My favorite of these was the woman who called about five minutes after it happened and goes, Oh, what was that on the Richter scale? I was frustrated and said sarcastically, I don't know, ma'am. Our seismometer is broken. She says, oh... She wasn't smart enough to get the sarcasm. Story 15. Not a dispatcher, but hopefully this will still be interesting to someone. 
It happened early on in my flight lessons, and it was fairly cold out one day, but we didn't think icing would be a problem since there weren't any clouds below 12,000 feet. We got up around 2,500 AGL, and my instructor, who although he had a few hundred hours flying was still a bit new as a CFI, told me to do a power-off stall. This simulates stalling on final approach to landing. Essentially, you slow down to approach speed, flaps extended, and then keep holding your altitude using the elevator without adding power until you stall. To recover, you apply full power and pitch the nose down until you gain enough speed to level out again. So I stall the plane, applied full power, and the engine almost quit, which obviously is exactly what you want to happen when you apply full power to recover from a stall. The engine didn't actually die, but my instructor immediately took the controls and asked me to start going through the engine trouble checklist while he contacted the airport and asked for clearance to land as soon as possible. The controller gave us clearance and then asked what was going on. When he found out, he very pointedly asked if we wanted to declare an emergency. At first, my instructor started to say, No, we've, we've gone through most of the checklist without any issues. But then, and I can still remember the tone in his voice, he says, No, we almost had an engine failure. We're declaring emergency. And changed our squawk code to 7700, general emergency. And holy hell, did that get a response. They literally shut down the entire airport for the 15 or so minutes it took us to get back and land. It was early evening, and as we were coming back, I could see the lights from what seemed to be every volunteer fire department in a 10-mile radius of the airport turning out to come up to the field and provide assistance if needed. My instructor's phone started blowing up, because apparently a lot of his friends have apps that notify them when someone squawks 7700, and they saw our plane's registration number. Pro tip, don't do that. If there's an actual emergency, your friend won't need the distraction. The controller at the airport was cool as ice and he made regular requests for status updates as we came in. Fortunately, nothing to report, and I could also hear him talking to a couple of airliners about 20 miles from the airport, letting them know where they would divert if we did end up having issues with our landing. As we lined up for landing, I could see all of the airport's emergency vehicles waiting on the taxiway, and I mean all of them. They really brought out the cavalry. The taxiway seemed to just be absolutely covered in flashing lights. I seriously couldn't believe it. We were just two random guys in a Cessna Skyhawk, and I'm pretty confident that if Air Force One had declared an emergency, they wouldn't have gotten much bigger of a response than we did. Fortunately, the ending is pretty boring. After we got within gliding distance of the runway, they called off the volunteer firefighters, and we landed without any problems. We eventually determined that carburetor icing was the problem. Still, literally everyone involved, ATC, the airport safety chief, not sure of title, the flight school owner, and the other instructors at the school, said we made the right call. In the moment, it was pretty scary. I still hadn't even learned how to land by myself, but it was a great lesson on taking things seriously, and how much emergency crews would rather be safe than sorry. Story 16. Not exactly a dispatcher, but definitely a non-emergency line operator. I was working at the cable-slash-phone company in sales, and I received a call from an elderly gentleman. He started talking about how his wife had fallen and he's pretty sure she hit her head. He got her in a chair, but she wouldn't stand and seemed confused. He wasn't sure what to do next. I was just so caught off guard and confused as to how this man reached me and what was happening. I soon realized he had dialed 611 rather than 911, which in America routes you to your phone provider. I didn't have the ability to dial 911 for him due to our phone systems, but advised him as to what to do. I just can't believe he got through all the menu prompts and whatever to get to me and still think it was the emergency line. That is an impressive mistake, but the poor guy was probably so shaken up. I hope that things ended up alright for them. Story 17. Something non-dispatchers may not realize is that if calls aren't transferred properly, or if someone is transferred from agencies without direct access to your 911 line, calls come in non-emergency. This is just a super brief PSA on why if you're able to call 911, please do so. Don't have your cousin in the next state over or something call for you. It's going to get routed, weird, and waste precious time. Hence, I was still in non-emergency training, learning about how to take noise complaints and questions about paperwork, when I suddenly had a man yelling about his son not breathing. I was so not prepared. It still can be kind of jarring to be expecting a routine administrative call and suddenly have a full-scale emergency on the line. Since being a full-fledged dispatcher, the worst call in which someone actually dialed our non-emergency line that comes to mind was a lady saying her son had been in a single car accident. She kept rambling on with all kinds of information that wasn't really pertinent to anything. After a little bit, as a formality, I interrupt to say, just confirming there are no injuries? She responded, no, well, he does have glass in his eyes. The dude legit had glass shards in his eyeballs and mom decided that wasn't noteworthy to the call. As soon as she finally mentioned that, medics were dispatched. Story 18. Non-medical related. Back in the 90s, used to be a dispatcher in a telecommunications operations center in the UK. One day, I'm sitting there with a not much going on and a fault condition lights up. Several hundred customers just had service go down for some inexplicable reason. No alarm codes indicating a failure condition, just a slew of random alarms immediately followed by a complete loss of communications with this particular node. 
mode, which is usually controlled via equipment in a large metal cabinet that sits on a street corner in a neighborhood. So my shift partner and I are trying to figure out what might have happened, while the main call center starts receiving calls from disgruntled customers. The non-emergency phone rings. I pick up and on the other end is an enormously polite man. Good morning. Is this... company? Uh, yes it is. How may I help you? This is Sergeant... name... with the Territorial Army. I'm terribly sorry. I think we may have damaged some of your equipment. I... see. Can you tell me where it's located? Right now, it's located between 100 and 200 on street name. It's a bit spread out. I'm very sorry, mate. I'm afraid we ran over it with a tank. Now, for those of you who live in the UK, it was a reasonably common sight, at least in my town, to see the Territorial Army. This is like the National Guard in the US. They'd be driving tanks and other vehicles on the roads, not on trucks. Apparently, a relatively new driver had ridden up on the side of the road and utterly annihilated our equipment, spreading it across an entire residential street. It took the next three days with all of my on-calls and other texts to get service back. It's one thing to have to replace a board or connection in a cabinet. It's something else entirely to have to reprovision an entire node with guys splicing hundreds of fiber optic cables for hours and hours. Oh, he sure was polite with it, and admittedly, not really an emergency, actually. Definitely good that you know, but nothing's, like, in danger or harm's way. So I think this is fair to be not an emergency. Although dramatic, for sure. Story 19. Not a dispatcher or anything, but friend worked in a pharmacy for a while. Junkie woman walks in asking to speak to the pharmacist because her foot hurts. She goes in and a few minutes later they hear all the pharmacists screaming. Turns out the woman had somehow managed to lose three of her toes and brought them in with her wrapped in a napkin in her pocket. Also turns out she wasn't going to the ER about it because both her and her boyfriend had warrants out for their arrest. Next time he saw her, she had amputated her leg up to the knee, so it must have been pretty serious. Story 20. Family friend works as an EMT, and was responding to a call from a woman who was complaining of abdominal pain. When he gets there, the patient explains it's most likely period pain, as she was known to have usually painful periods every once in a while, which often sometimes leave her hospitalized. She said numerous times that she was sorry for wasting his time for coming out and all that, and claimed her husband was over-exaggerating, and shouldn't have called in in the first place. Family friend takes her to the hospital anyway, and it turns out it wasn't period pain. It was her appendix that was literally about to burst. Any abdominal pain condition in a woman is just unfortunate. It does get really hard to diagnose what the heck is going on down there. Clearly, even for the women themselves. Although, I will say a lot of times, women do have problems like pain in the abdominal area and they're not taken seriously in medicine because period pains, and then it does turn out to be something more serious. That admittedly does always really frustrate me. Shout out to the family, though, for taking everything seriously. Definitely straight up saved this woman's life. Burst appendix is a one-way ticket to dead town, as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, that is all the stories we have for today. I've never personally called 911, but I'm sure some people in the comments have, so hey, if you have any stories that line up with this, non-emergency, whatever, throw them down there. But for now, thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day or night wherever you are, and I will see you in the next one.